Hello, I'm Lizzie. And I'm Izzy, and we need help. Each week we stumble through a new book, method, or concept that might take us one step closer to being our best self. Yes, we make fun of ourselves. And others. But mostly just ourselves. So here is to seriously not taking self-help quite so seriously. Welcome everybody to the Afterbirth for Imperfection. That's for part one. I'm Lizzie. And I'm Izzy, and this is the We Need Help Afterbirth. Afterbirth. <laughs> <laughs> is that what sound it makes? Is that what sound afterbirth makes? I don't know because I had two cesareans. Okay. <laughs> That'd be funny if the doctor would yeah. like make those sounds. Like I, That's why I'm not mouth. a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be making those. Sounds. <laughs> My afterbirth would be like. <laughs> did, did she just queef? No, that was just the afterbirth. No, no it's not a queef. That's that is the just afterbirth. the afterbirth. So, uh, what are we starting with? The nicest prisons. We talked about well, that. Well, so. afterbirth. I mean, we got to just uh, we got to thank Brene one more time before oh, yeah. we like totally like go into this. This book is so good. Please, anybody who suffers from shame, which is everybody, please go get this book. I mean, it's so good, right? Yes. Some, like people, the, some people suffer from shame. I enjoy it. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, enjoy yeah. my shame. Love it. Make fun of it. <laughs> bask in it like a clownfish. Uh, yeah, but the gifts of imperfection... All right. So what did we talk about? We talked about where are the nicest prisons? And you were spot on with this, Lizzie, because the nicest prisons, both minimum and maximum security, are in Norway. Norway! Thank so you, the, Norway. The minimum security prison uh, is, is called Bastoy Prison in Norway, and it's located on an island, Bastoy Island in Oslofjord. This prison, <laughs> that was my Norwegian accent. This prison houses a little over 100 inmates who, within the prison complex, they enjoy luxuries like tennis, horseback riding, fishing, and sunbathing. And they live in tasteful little cottages and they work on cottages. lush cottages. Did I, did I say colleges? Co <laughs> colleges. They get like little tiny Harvards. Yeah, little, little, little university campuses <laughs> that they live on. <laughs> <laughs> and they could pretend to be professors at their little mini campus. They have, um, they have smart glasses that they put yeah, on. Yeah, and, one of them yeah. is the dean. Another one is like, yeah. Everybody tries to sleep with the good looking one. <laughs> anyway, that's that's the minimum security. And the maximum security is located in Halden, Norway. And Halden Prison was established in 2010. And they focus on rehabilitation. So this is, they have very humane conditions, beautiful architecture, and a design that provides a home-like feel. So yeah, the staff there is not armed. They have to create a sense of community, um, minimize violence. They have therapy there. Um, there's no electric fence, no snipers, no towers, no barbed wire, nothing like that. There's just a couple surveillance cameras. So yeah, oh, and I I I would challenge us all to go and see. Uh, I mean, if we're rehabilitating people like we say we are, like this to me makes a lot more sense, doesn't yeah. it? Like if we're gonna try to make like active people who are giving to our society, this to me is like kind of owning up to that rather than the way that we do, which out of the top five uh, uh, least humane prisons or uh, worse conditions, uh, the U.S. has two of them. Uh, it goes Venezuela, Rikers Island, New York. Uh, there's one in Bangkok. Uh, there's one in Russia. And then the I believe the top one is in Florence, Colorado. 
I mean, which fucking surprises me. That's because weird. Thought, yeah. Yeah. Colorado is such like a, I mean, didn't, weren't they the first to legalize weed and, Yeah, you know, they're like, cool, hey, dude, like, yeah. let's hit the, hit the slopes. And let's go like, to Breck. Let's go to Breck. Hey, yeah, let's like totally hit the slopes and like chill. And <sighs> am, I, am I wrong? I'm probably way <laughs> off on that. <laughs> And <laughs> let's yeah. offend Coloradoans. <laughs> well, they, they should be ashamed of themselves for having yeah. the worst prison. Yeah, they deserve being offended. Yeah, um, yeah I don't that. know. I'm, they have they they have fixed. I mean, I totally believe in like not criminalizing uh, small time drug drug offenses at all. I just don't. I don't. I don't see. I think uh, addiction is from trauma. Um, for the most part. And I just, I can't stand to see like these people that just got like accidentally caught with like three mistakes and now they're spending life in prison. I just don't, I, I can't. Yeah. As a libertarian, I, I think I absolutely agree. And I think if people want to do drugs, they're going to do drugs. Um, and they should be able to do drugs. So yeah, that's my opinion on that. Um, but I, as far as having the prisons be this nice, I'm just wondering, because I do also believe that if you do something wrong, there should be some type of consequence for that. So what is what would be a good consequence for people who do break the law? Well, I, I, th- I, I mean, I'm just saying, like when it sounds like when I'm when I go to Norway and convince all the people I hate to go there and kill a bunch of motherfuckers. I would like to be. <laughs> oh, did not everybody's mind go there? That's weird. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, if you're not, a, if you're Nazi, which it takes to be a big time criminal, right? Like, don't you want there, if you are going to send these people back into the earth, yeah. don't you want to like fix them? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. But I, I'm just wondering, I'm wondering if there should, what the consequences for criminal behavior should be in that case. Yeah, I definitely don't think it should be like ritzy like this, like island living. Right. I like. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be it committing, be, committing crimes. Be, like, it's nicer than my apartment. Be, yeah, this looks, sounds really nice. Like, and I can tell you that horseback riding is not cheap. Neither is tennis playing, but like, I think being active, doing yoga, being mindful, taking care of animals, I think therapy, I think, uh, you know, I, I truly believe that like, maybe it should be like how kind of like my conditions were for outdoor education. Like we had to stay, it was, uh, we had cots, but we had to stay in like nice tents or like kind of like yurts. Yurts. Oh, I love yurts. Yurts. Yurts could solve this whole thing. I, Am think, I, like, I think they should. <laughs> yeah, I think yurts is the way to go. And the I yurt. don't think that, I don't think uh, you should be allowed to profit off of prisons. I think that's yeah. a huge problem. I think if anybody's making money off of prisons, I think it should be uh, the... I think they should be able to, if they're making money, they should be able to save that money and have that come with them when they are reintegrated into society. Mm. So they're not desperate when they yeah. get out. Right. Yeah. But, because that, that's yeah. a big, um, big issue. You know, they have a, a record. It's hard for them to get a job. You know, it's, it could be a whole, whole, whole nother episode. I think another, another thing is like, and, and, and teaching them something that they are able to do, uh, some sort of, you know, why wouldn't you uh, teach them to be a carpenter, teach them to be a plumber, teach them like, why is, why are we not doing, I'm sure we are doing this, but I, I think we're fucking it up really. Yeah. And I'm our sure, tax yeah. dollars are going right into these prison owners uh, pockets. This is kind of a way that they just kind of, like kind of funnel our tax dollars into their pockets by arresting a bunch of people that really either need therapy or they need, 
you know, some sort of further education to become an active part of society. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, yeah. Yeah. All right. I think we should be ashamed of ourselves as uh, in the U.S. that we have two out of five of the worst prisons. I mean, you expect Russia. Yeah, Am Russia. I, is, I mean, the country is like a prison, right? Russia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you go to a restaurant, you're at a prison there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. I'm, now I'm really pissing off like or the wrong country. Yeah, you don't want to piss but, off Russia, girl. <laughs> No. And then Thailand, like they're like, you don't want to get stuck in a Thailand prison. I know that. And did you know Venezuela had the highest murder rates? I did not know that. I didn't know that either. I wonder why. So we're, maybe we're going to have to do that as an afterbirth for the afterbirth during part two. Uh, Why does Venezuela... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> double fart double afterbirth <laughs> all right well let's move on to a decidedly nicer topic the nicest airlines Ooh, the nicest mm-hmm. airlines is etihad airways which is the emirates abu dhabi it's been number one on many lists it's won every travel award they have luxury flights that are extremely opulent um <laughs> You can get anything you want on this plane. Um, you can stay in a double bedroom suite during your journey. It's called The Residence. And you get a personal butler and chef. This sounds amazing. And how much is it? Do you have any idea? 30000 Per flight? Per Yeah, per ticket. 30,000 euros. Okay, but what if we were to share a room? No? I- <laughs> Like you and I, you and I sharing a room? Is that yeah. a, like? No, you can share a room, I think, but it's just, but it, you still probably have an air, like a seat, I'm sure, because you probably have to fasten a seatbelt. No, I don't feel like it. I think you pay a certain amount and you don't, you. Can we talk about how frustrating it is that they make you put the seat straight up? <laughs> On regular flights, like what is that doing? It can't, like it's two inches. I know. And then my my friend and my friend from from college, um, she would always like, they would always joke around because the tray tables always have to be up, and so she would put it down and go death, and then up life, <laughs> death, life, death, life. <laughs> like, what is it gonna <laughs> do? Your tray table, but a tray table, I could understand. It could like. Because maybe you yeah. can hit your stupid yeah. face yeah. on it. Yeah, but the chair, the reclining chair, yeah, I don't get it. Maybe there, it's because in an emergency landing, it's harder for the people behind you to get out if your chair is back. So it's just ease of exit. There's only one situation where I can tell you two inches makes a difference. <laughs> and flying ain't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just say it's it's mind boggling. And so I don't even put I don't even put my seat back anymore. I've quit. They don't don't they come around? Oh, you don't put it back to start. Okay, because it's annoying nope. when they're like, tap, tap, come on, uh, come on. Well, and then I feel like my ego gets going. I'm like, fuck you. You're gonna tell me where to put my seat. And then <laughs> I then all of a sudden I'm raging against this poor woman that's abused all day. Yeah. We don't I don't fly uh Etihad. Airways yeah. for thirty thousand dollars a ticket. What is that? How much it was? Yes, I mean for that, just for that room, right? Oh, okay. But yeah. is there is there poor people uh, spots on the plane or? Let me look. Etihad economy. <laughs> it sounds like an oxymoron. Seat. Yeah. They, I, they like a hand reaches out of the computer and just slaps me. <laughs> um, I, their economy looks like kind of like an economy plus would look like for you know for us. So, who's your favorite to fly? Hmm, good question. Let me think. I have I've flown Turkish Airlines. And mm. it was fantastic. Much, much better than their prisons, I'm guessing. <laughs> or their, <laughs> it was an experience. I mean, their catering was fantastic. They were just like yeah. Turkish delights and all this and all that. So they, they had the best service. Um, okay, Etihad, a flight. It's not bad. 
It's it's like a regular standard prices of oh, for okay. their economy seats. So yeah. Okay. Let's Sounds put that amazing. on our bucket list. Okay. To That's fly on bucket hat. list. Yeah. So let's see. Um I, I I generally let's what have what have I flown? I've flown Virgin before. I didn't like it that much, but I because they have like purple lighting. I don't like like these 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 colorful lighting fancy. when people have that it's in their fancy. house. Sorry, when you have like a red or blue lighting and they have like purple lighting and okay. that just bugged me. I don't like any cold lighting whatsoever. Yeah. I don't want to look like, uh, like I want warm light. I don't yeah. want anything. Yeah. I don't want yeah. anything weird. But what I, I did like, to, go ahead. I don't want to have to pay for anything extra on the flight. Yeah. What I did love with Virgin is you get your own capsule. Because when I fly, I don't like being, even if I'm flying with somebody, I don't want to be, I want to be in my own little world, in my own little flight world. So Virgin, you get your own little cocoon and they have really great food and really great espresso. And I, I love I that. Really, yeah. So I, 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 I them. think I, I enjoyed my Virgin flight very much. Okay. Virgin. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what's your name? What's his name that owns that? He has a Richard Branson. Branson. Richard Branson. Thank you, Dick Branson. I yeah, love thank you. Thank you for the nice flight. And then I usually fly when I fly um, from Poland to the US, I usually do KLM. I like KLM. I like the service. I like the comfort. Food's all right. KLM. How about you? I don't. Um, I haven't taken a lot of like nice airlines. I usually am on American, mm -hmm. Delta. Um, I've taken a lot of shitty airlines like Spirit. <laughs> like I have a lot more ambition like three months before when I'm booking the flight of like my my level of patience because I don't have any patience at all. So I'm usually like irritated. But my favorite just run of the mill is Delta. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. always super nice. Um, I had this on this air. Okay, so... Let me see if I can get this right. I flew on the day that this air traffic controller in Chicago lit the the air traffic uh, tower on fire. Oh, my goodness. So, so I was flying out of St. Thomas that day. Um, and basically, it shut down uh, flight in the in the U.S. for a day. So there were just a few flights going along and... Somehow I called Jason. I was stuck in Puerto Rico at the time. I said, Jason, we're stuck here. I said, can you get us a flight? He called JetBlue. JetBlue got us out of Puerto Rico into LaGuardia. And then, uh, I mean, we left at like five o'clock in the morning and we ended up flying from LaGuardia to O'Hare um, at like 1130 that night. Mm -hmm. So Scarlett was nursing at the time. She was like two years old. Wow. And uh, she was exhausted and she just wanted to nurse. So I was like nursing her and um, this uh, this airline attendant like said, "You're good. if you bought her a, a flight, you have to buckle her in. And I was like, can she just please nurse? Like she is so exhausted. And keep in mind, she was like extremely small for her size. Yeah. So she could have like they... Well, everyone started screaming at me. This guy, this like flaming guy across the, the hall or the aisle for me, he was like, just my father's dying. Just buckle her in. I mean, the whole, like everybody was on edge. Um, and I like, I, they just, everyone had like, it was like crazy. It was mayhem. And so I buckled her in. She cried herself to sleep right there. We took off. If it were me now, I'd be like, you know what, bitch? Call CNN because <laughs> this is on. Yeah. But I was just so tired, emotionally <sighs> exhausted. She yeah. was tired. So this Indian guy, and I would like to put this out. If you know, if you hear my voice and you are him, I want to reach out to you because I've been trying to find him for years. Like I've got online, tried to find him. I put out article after article. I wrote stories about him. So he says to me after we, we, 
uh, we took off. I, I mean, tears were just rolling down oh my, my face. Gosh. Everyone had been so horrible. And he goes, I have water and snacks in my bag. Do not make eye contact with anyone on this plane at all. He goes, even animals take care of their young. Oh, and he and I talked for the entire flight. He was an angel. He, I mean, I still think of him. So when we were getting off, of course, I'm gathering Scarlett and he's going out right before me and he leaves. And I, so I'm not sure he was true. He was actually real. <laughs> he was like an angel. He just disappeared. I tried to find him yeah. to get his information. And I, he was just gone. And I still oh. am like, oh my God, he was just, there are angels on earth. He saved me. I, I literally couldn't breathe. The like people had been so cruel. I mean, it was a very stressful day, Yeah, but it was just like, it was just insane. It was insane. So if you're out there an older Indian guy, <laughs> Amazing! I think you. Oh. He, I, I think he lived in the Chicagoland area, but he would. He said, "I'll never fly this airline again. Never in my life." Yeah. But then, Jet. Thank you, JetBlue. Uh, you you gave me the worst experience. But then the next flight I had on the way home because we lived in St. Thomas at the time, I had the best experience. Yeah, and I don't think. I mean, it was probably a lot of the passengers that made the experience bad too, you know, it was the passengers. It was, I'm sure that woman had been through hell that day yeah. because so many flights were canceled, but yeah, it was just crazy. Yeah. There, there's my crazy flight story. I I'm sure I have a crazy flight story. I just can't remember the worst airline I've ever flown was, and I was surprised air Italia. I thought it would oh. be like, great food, you know, air Italia. Yeah. It was, it was hell. They lost the bags. Um, they were just rude. It was uncomfortable. I had to keep asking for water. You know, how usually they go around with water, like water, water. Yeah. They, I had to keep asking for it. The bathrooms, they had one bathroom working bathroom. The rest of the bathrooms were out of order. It was, it was hell. So I will never yeah. fly Al Italia again ever. Um, Ooh. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah. KLM, I usually have the best experience when flying internationally. And then Delta, Delta and KLM are partners. So there you go. Oh, they're, okay. they're a partner airline. Yeah, they're, always, so, yeah. they're always so nice. Yeah. I just flew them into uh, to Lexington, Kentucky to go see Pony Finals. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, they were amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on. So I, I might have missed it, but I had a, like a little quote about brunch because I asked what brings you the most joy in your life. And you said brunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I said, it's not uh, quite breakfast. It's not quite lunch. And you get the piece of cantaloupe at the end. And I'm like, I, I actually forgot what that was from, but it was from an episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> Season one, episode nine, life on the fast lane. And it's when Marge gets seduced by a French man. And oh, he my. says, meet me tomorrow for brunch. And March is like, what's brunch? And he says, <laughs> you love it. It's not quite breakfast. It's not quite lunch, but it comes with a slice of cantaloupe at the end. You don't get completely <laughs> what you would at breakfast, but you get a good meal. <laughs> so that's, that's brunch. And that's where that quote was from. Oh my God. Of course you would be inspired <laughs> by the Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> So that, um, what else do we have? Oh, we had Brene Brown's mantra to stay authentic. So she wrote yes. in this book, whenever I'm faced with a vulnerable situation, I get deliberate with my intentions by repeating this to myself. Don't shrink. Don't puff up. Stand your sacred ground. Saying oh. this little mantra helps me remember not to get too small so that other people are comfortable and not to throw up my armor as a way to protect myself. So that's her mantra. Don't shrink, don't puff up, stand your sacred ground. And we were supposed to come up with our, our own mantras when going into vulnerable situations. Do you have a mantra? Do you have something you tell it, yourself? Always. I've always said it like health, wealth, and abundance, health, wealth, and abundance, health, wealth, and abundance. And mm -hmm. like, it like kind of reminds me, but I like her so much. Yeah. I wish I could, I think I might steal it. Stand your sacred ground. 
Stand yeah. your sacred. But I like don't puff up because sometimes I can get extremely loud and obnoxious and uh, almost like off, a uh, very off putting, I think, when I'm nervous, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. I'll just be like, I don't want the conversation to go wrongly. Yeah. So I'll dominate. Oh, but this is good. If I'm ever out and about and I get drunk, mm. like I, I, I love to drink, but I hate to be drunk. Mm. You will, I can't stand it. I get silent mm. and I just smile. Like, please don't say anything wrong. Just get home, do what you got to do. I cannot stand it. I like, it makes me so nervous to be drunk that I'm to be drunk. I can't. Oh, that's okay. Let's explore that. So why? Uh, because I'm afraid I'll say something. Oh, like, you don't trust yourself. Uh, like, no, I'm not afraid that I'll say something like, like, incor- I'm afraid I'll say something incorrectly. Oh, so it's fear of what other people might think of you or. Yeah, I just think I don't like the way I sound when uh, I'm drunk. I don't like the way it feels. I don't like, like. I could forget what I was about to say or like going to say. It's just, okay. it's weird. I can't. And I've always been like that. Like wow. always. Wow. Uh, this one, she's not our friend anymore. Um, but this one ex friend of ours, she, the first time she met me, she thought I was like touched in the head because I was just drunk. Really? Like, <laughs> touched in the head. I like that. <laughs> and, and, Stephanie's like, uh, no, Lizzie's just drunk. That's what she looks like if she's drunk. Wow. So when I, I don't get drunk anymore, obviously, but when I used to, people would know because I would get smilier. Like I had an That's ex. That's me. He would say, um, but like brighter, like he, he's like the light turns on because I'm normally, I, you know, had such high anxiety, normally social anxiety that drinking loosened me up and I would just like be able to be more myself. Um, so drinking kind of enabled me to be who I really wanted to be, but was too afraid to be. Um, Well, there's like this sweet bowling spot in drinking. It's not, it's not in the beginning because there's, it's the same as normal. And it's obviously not at the end, but there's like this spot in drinking that you can get strikes in bowling. Hmm. You know, there's like, there's, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's a sweet yeah. spot where you're loose enough, but you're yeah. not too loose to make yeah. mistakes. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the strike zone of yeah. drinking. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then like you turn into like a blubbering, like loser or, or there's just the plain one. I, it always like, and I, this probably should be like sitting at a meeting. I'm not a recovering alcoholic. I'm just a regular one. But like, <laughs> there's a point in there that like, you know, it, it, like when people like, why even have one drink? I, it blows my mind that people do it. There's a saying in, in with alcoholics, it's, um, one drink is too much and a thousand is never enough. So (laughs) no, there's, I think there's a sweet, there's a strike zone in there. Yeah. See, I well, not for alcoholics. (laughs) Oh, I'm just talking regular, regular people, normies. Yeah. Normies. I don't think it's nor. I don't think it's normal to have one beer. You just take a nap. Yeah. Well, you know, unless you're just having like a barbecue. If you're having barbecue, then one beer is enough for pizza. Then you can't have more than one beer because then you're going to be too full. So when I first got sober, I decided I had a Christmas party at my house. I, I was running this, uh, this this small recruitment company and I had a Christmas party at my house. And I had like, I think, seven employees. And um, I invited them over and they said, OK, we'll bring the food. You get the booze because they didn't know I had quit at that point. And I'm just like, fine, you know. So I went out and I'm like, okay, seven people, including me, eight, I'm not drinking, seven people, seven bottles of wine. That should be enough, right? Like a bottle for each person. And so I bought seven bottles of wine and I, you know, brought, they they came over, they brought this food and I opened up a bottle and just poured a little bit for everybody. 
And they just sat there sipping. I opened one bottle the whole night and I was like, I remember staring at them like, wow, (laughs) really? (laughs) Like, it was just amazing to me. Like people really just, just, just taste a little bit and that's it. You know, like it was, it was so so crazy for me. I'm not in recovery and maybe I should be, (laughs) but like that seems low. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I'm like, okay. Like I was even thinking, am I getting too little? Like, I'm like, no, a bottle of person should be good. (laughs) Well, that sounds about right. I mean, for a whole night, it seems like I always get too much alcohol because I'm afraid to run out of it for people. Like I don't want to, and I, I get too much of everything. It's not just alcohol or, or yeah. food or, you know, it's anything. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I am definitely, uh, uh, Jason calls me double down delicia because I have to like have, that. I love, I have to have a lot of stuff, but like, it just blows my mind. Well, my uncle, my uncle Dave, he yeah. is a poor, like you can't be around him and drink. Yeah. I mean, I've gotten sideways with him so many times because I'm like, I can't handle drinking with him because he pours and pours and pours. And then I realized that I do that to people. I get oh, people drunk Yeah, all the time because I want them to have the best time possible. And I don't want them to have to feel like they have to ask. Yeah, but some some people probably don't want to c- come to a children's party and get sideways. <laughs> huh. What's your what's your drink? Do you have a drink? Like, what is your drink? I have a preferred drink, and I'm going to tell you about it because it's like the best thing. That I don't want this afterbirth to go too long. Yeah, but I need to. I we everybody needs help. So I was at this. Um, event. It was called the rock tree and it was 10 writers all, uh, went and wrote, wrote about, uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, and we went to this place called, called gringos, which I love. And they gave us, uh, cucumber infused tequila and soda with a lime. So we ended up naming it spa water, but there were 10 of us And we all, like, everybody just drank it the whole four days we were there for everything. And then when we went home to our respective islands, because we all lived on an island, we all blogged for islands, um, we kind of reported back two weeks later. And, like, everyone had had lost at least five pounds. (laughs) Because tequila has pre and probiotics. It's, like, it's super good for the gut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is, um, you know, for normies. They yeah. are like, if you're going to drink, that's the right thing to drink. So I will drink tequila and soda with a lime. That's my mm. favorite that's go-to. go-to. But um, I mean, if it's just having one drink, I, you know, I guess I would have a glass of red wine if I just had one drink, like at dinner. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. But, and I love beer. When I was 12 years old, I used to go out on a paddle board or no, a paddle boat. I would take the paddle boat out at my Aunt Pam's for the entire afternoon, and I'd bring a six-pack of O'Doul's. <laughs> <laughs> at 12, I love this flavor of beer. Beer. That's funny. It's so kooky. Yeah. It's weird. I still drink non-alcoholic beer all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. I love it yeah. because it doesn't make you tired. Yeah. Makes sense, and you get the taste. Yeah. I, yeah. I just love it. But yeah. All right. Well, this was a great afterbirth. Covered a lot of ground. Uh, <laughs> Booze, prisons, <laughs> the sound of afterbirth, and airlines. There we go. <laughs> and my drinking history. Yeah, yeah. What more could you ask for? <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna have to be a full episodes for Iza's drinking yeah. history. You were gonna have to do a couple. That's gonna be parts one, two, and three. <laughs> <laughs> All All right, right, my love. See you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Love you. Love you. Bye. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Rate and follow us if you like us. If you don't, please don't. And come visit us at www 
dot the we need help podcast.com there you can find show notes links for books you can join audible which is you know how we actually read our books <laughs> we listen to them and we have special exclusive content just for you also feel free to subscribe to our patreon account that's where you can support us financially because we need it and it can be anywhere from a dollar to 100 billion dollars <laughs> a month you know whatever you can afford <laughs> And uh, the link to our Patreon account is www.patreon, and that's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash We Need Help Podcast. And you can support um, you can support us on there. We would really appreciate it because we do need help. Awesome! And we will see you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Thanks, Bye. loves. Bye.